everyone. Welcome to the Carbon Copies Foundation Journal Club meeting for March 2020. My name is Anita Fowler and I am an aspiring biomedical student devoted to the goal of substrate independence and whole brain emulation. I will try to be thorough but keep this presentation short and sweet so ample time can be spent on discussion. Um, so the paper I'll be discussing is an argument by Robert McIntyre on the website of his organization Nectome called The Case for Glutaraldehyde, Structural Encoding and Preservation of Long-Term Memory. Now I chose this paper because whatever the stuff of ourselves is made of, it most certainly includes, if not exists within, the umbrella of memory. Um, this paper is based on current memory research discussing existing theories of memory, what is involved in them, and whether or not they may be preserved with existing technology. So to give you a little background, Robert McIntyre back in 2015, along with Gregory Fay, published a paper introducing aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation as a means to preserve the brain's ultrastructure. This led him to joining 21st century medicine and winning the Brain Preservation Foundation Prize for successfully preserving a full pig connectome using this technique and using glutaraldehyde. Since then, uh, McIntyre has seemed eager to keep the ball rolling and move to human brains by starting his organization, Nectome though there has been some pushback toward the idea of being able to store the brain's memories for future emulation, McIntyre seems determined to do the research necessary to show whether or not this method of preservation will actually store memories, whether what we think of as fully, a fully preserved connectome is enough, um, basically if the information is there. And that brings us to McIntyre's hypothesis. Um, that is that glutaraldehyde fixation may preserve the information that encodes an organism's long-term memories. And when he says memory, he is referring to all of the following, semantic, long-term, and episodic memory. To be more specific, um, McIntyre defines long-term memory as, quote, observable changes in behavior that persist for longer than 24 hours including semantic memories, long-term motor skills, and episodic memories. I'm not exactly sure why he chose 24 hours versus two or 12, like in some of the studies he references, but 24 is what he has decided on for his definition. The first point that McIntyre discusses is that memory is physically robust withstanding traumatic events like temporal global ischemia, where the brain loses its extracellular space and deep hypothermic circulatory arrest where all electrical activity is lost. In both these cases, the long-term memories of humans and other mammals have been shown to return after successful recovery. Additionally, within the component parts currently thought to make up memory, there can be some loss. Um, Research with engrams shows that they can survive even when some of the neurons or synapses are lost, either due to natural decay or external destruction. In his paper, McIntyre reviews evidence of memory encoding as durable changes in synaptic structure, protein distribution, gene expression, and other physical changes all of which are discussed in some detail through the concept of cycles and engrams. Oh. McIntyre shows that for long-term memory formation to occur, it means that, um, it means that distribution of neural proteins, especially synaptic proteins, must change and that the changes must occur at multiple neurons and synapses. As a result, we see the occurrence of self-reinforcing cycles and m-gram formation. Now to go into a little more detail about what he means about a self-reinforcing cycle, 
he cites what he refers to as the amphicycle, involving receptors and molecules at a glutamergic, glutamatergic synapses, all of which he listed in his paper. So before I continue, though, I'd like to briefly explain part of this cycle for those who are unfamiliar to drive this concept home. So this is a vastly oversimplified um, before and after drawing of a synapse during long-term potentiation or when signals are such that we will form long-term memories. So we start out on the left with a synapse with a sort of spindly looking dendrite spine. Um, and what you see in yellow is the neurotransmitter glutamate being released from one neuron, triggering the opening of an amphoreceptor on the other neuron. Now an amphoreceptor is a protein in the cell membrane that allows positively charged sodium ions to come into the cell. If enough sodium gets through to make the inside of the cell positively charged enough, then the magnesium ion in blue will be released, opening an MM, uh, NMDA receptor, which is shown in pink. When that receptor is open, calcium ions are then able to enter the cell. Why these things flow the way they do and everything involving uh, involves further details about ion channels and gradients, and we won't get into that now, but suffice it to say that when the calcium gets in, some exciting things happen um, with the protein kinases and transcription that basically lead to making those AMPA receptors more sensitive, making more of them. So they allow more sodium to come in so that more calcium can come in so that they can make more receptors and on and on and on. So you end up with stronger synapses like the one on the right with a more mushroom-like dendrite spine and more going on. So we have a cycle that perpetuates and strengthens itself. Um, and what's great is that even if a molecule or some small part is lost, the cell can still continue, or the cycle can still continue. Um, these cycles perpetuate also in the soma of the cell to influence the making of protein products, further signaling, and even epigenetic modifications. Um, but put another way, McIntyre references the research of Chen et al. Um, saying that information is, is encoded, quote, redundantly in the states of mutually reinforcing macromolecules such as proteins, mRNAs, nanostructural components, and even modifications to DNA. Now, what's extra exciting and interesting about this reference is that although the most commonly held and most referenced in McIntyre's paper, um, memory models are based in synaptic theories of memory, these particular researchers represent a genomic theory of memory. So I feel like McIntyre is definitely covering all of his bases here. So to summarize, um, the summarizing factor here uh, is that despite individual molecule loss, these are self-reinforcing cycles and, quote, the cycle itself is able to maintain its state almost indefinitely. Now, let's zoom out from the neuron-to-neuron -neuron relationship and we'll see what happens when a whole assembly of neurons alter their synaptic structure during memory encoding what we get are called engrams. Now, if you're not already familiar with engrams, when they occur, they create or are a pattern that can easily be accessed or recreated, used, and updated at a later time. To give a better understanding, I grabbed this figure from the Jocelyn et al. 2015 paper, Finding the Engram, which McIntyre cites. Um, on the left, you see the encoding of an engram where there is a strengthening of connections between collections of neurons activated during the event. Those are shown in red. Uh, this is then consolidated over time so that it can more easily be recreated, allowing the memory to be retrieved. Now, when the engram is reactivated, there is a time of destabilization during which new information can be added and the engram can be adapted. It is then restabilized and through reconsolidation can go dormant and later be retrieved yet again. 
So like the self-reinforcing cycles discussed earlier, engrams too can survive the destruction of some of their parts. Some of the research McIntyre cites include studies on tagging and manipulation of engrams, erasing long-term memories, and even creating false memories in mice. So when we ask ourselves, how do memories survive, whether it's day-to-day -day life or traumatic events like global ischemia or DHCA, we can know based on this research that quote, biochemical cycles and the physical redundancy of engrams play a big role. Okay, so bringing all that back to how we can preserve all of this, how can we successfully stop in time these processes without losing the vital data that would one day perhaps enable us to use our earned knowledge of memory and integrate it with future technology that might be able to retrieve it? Um, McIntyre argues that glutaraldehyde is the candidate that may help us preserve the information that makes up memory. The pros he discusses are these. Um, it reacts rapidly to form crosslinks with tissue, creating a stable gel-like form resistant to decay. It can withstand major changes in pH, temperature, osmotic stress, etc. cetera. Uh, he pulls on research with other aldehydes as well, especially formaldehyde, to show the durability of aldehyde stabilized tissue. Proteins and mRNAs can be identified, labeled, and analyzed after the fact. Uh, glutaraldehyde is primarily used currently to prep tissue for electron microscopy because of this pre its pre preservation ability. Um, all biomolecules in the AMPA cycle are verifiably retained. And if you're curious, he actually links to a study for each and every molecule in his paper. Um, also, McIntyre notes that with a level of detail, uh, the level of detail um, the glutaraldehyde creates, it, quote, um, creates an injective mapping between durable memory states and preserved artifacts, end quote, which, quote, preserves comprehensive information about long-term memories. So with all this good news, how could anything be wrong? Uh, McIntyre does link to some drawbacks of glutaraldehyde. Uh, there is a loss of extracellular space. However, this may not actually be a problem as memories are shown to be recoverable in such cases, like with cerebral ischemia. And because of the dense crosslinks, visualization with probes is encumbered. However, with ever-improving slice and scan techniques, I wonder if this may be less of an issue if we're talking about destructive scan and copy for whole brain emulation. So to summarize all of this, I'll share some of McIntyre's arguments. One, it appears that all potential components within current memory theories, both synaptic and genomic, are able to be preserved with glutaraldehyde. Two, the noise induced by glutaraldehyde fixation appears to be less than what is used to create long-term memories. And three, that there are no current viable theories of memory that would account for the robustness of long-term memories that would not also be preserved with glutaraldehyde fixation. Now, with all that said, I know that there is intense interest by many in this method succeeding, and I'd be interested in knowing what may have been missed or overlooked. Um, additionally, I believe this was posted in late 2018 or early 2019, and there has been since further study in memory. With that said, I would like to open up the space to discussion, uh, other theories, ideas, counter arguments, updates on the research, et cetera. Thank you. That was really fantastic. What a great uh, presentation of the materials. Thank you. Um, at, the, at the risk of jumping the queue, I was going to just uh, actually, so I was going to say two things. First of all, I had the, the pleasure of sitting down yesterday with Robert, actually. It just so happened. And we discussed a bunch of things about Nectel. And um, one of the things he mentioned that he would still like to achieve is he would like to make uh, glutaraldehyde uh, fixation stable at a higher temperature because right now 
Um, it, you know, the samples still need to be preserved at, uh, I think, something like minus 138 degrees Celsius. And, uh, and that is more expensive than he would like. It's not a cheap way to preserve samples. So there's that. But other than that, it seems like everything is going very, very well right now in terms of technical, um, technical hurdles or challenges to overcome. Um, the other thing I, is that I just kind of wanted to ask you if you knew uh, what the main, I guess, the main complaints were or the main uh, challenges from others that he was trying to overcome with that paper. Do you know why this paper was written? In, in what context? I don't feel like I can say definitively um, because I haven't talked to him. <laughs> However, uh, there were a number of articles that were critical either because there were theories of memory that involved um, like broader electrical cycles that ha are lar seem largely dismissed in the scientific literature, uh, but nonetheless did create a little bit of pushback. And additionally, um, just the idea that Nectu may be claiming, hey, we can preserve human brains and bring them back at a later date and everything's gonna be great. Uh, I think I think the press got a hold of some of that and maybe took it a little bit further than was desirable. And so, you know, since McIntyre has been like, hey, we're we're doing research here, we're we're trying to figure this out. We know we have a, a good a good thing here, but we got to make sure if um, you know with current theories of memories that everything that we're claiming can be preserved can be preserved and it can be used for uh, different forms of research, not just the idea of hopeful whole brain emulation. Um, and certainly that he's not guaranteeing that we will be able to emulate a brain. So I think, I think he was basically trying to curb some of that and say, we are a research organization. This is some of the culmination of our research of what memory is and how glutaraldehyde may be able to um, preserve those memory traces. All right, yeah. So, I mean, I know that there are some other theories of memory out there, although they aren't very strongly supported. Um, it seems to me like what Nectome is doing should be enough to preserve memory. It, it feels almost like the only other major argument out there is kind of the one that we'll be discussing at the workshop that's coming up, which is this whole question about personal identity and which metaphysics you buy into, um, you know, as long as as the memory can be preserved. That's really the only other thing to worry about besides reconstruction, that whole technical issue. <laughs> How do right. you create an emulation out of that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even uh, the most recent paper that I've looked at um, it was just from last year, late last year, it was about synaptic clustering and memory formation, and it, it was more of a consolidation of theories, uh, but still, I believe, would, would be preserved with, uh, with glutaraldehyde, so, or at least with the long-term goal of what it'll be able to do. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else with questions? I don't want to dominate the floor. Um, I did have a question. Um, uh, how long, how long after after um, uh, a patient is deceased? How how long, um, like, how long do they have before um, the like all of the uh, components start to break down before? Um, uh, before, like they're unsavable. Like, a, a, like, what's what's um, like the maximum amount of time a deceased patient can go before they're being given the uh, glutaraldehyde treatment before they actually start losing those components that define their memories. Um, so, from what I've read, there can start. I mean, it depends on the the cause of death, I suppose, but there can start to be loss 
really, really quickly after. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of techniques with cooling of the body and everything to make it last a little bit longer. But I, I know that some of what I've read um, that Hayworth is posted from the Brain Preservation Foundation uh, talks about almost trying to trying to administer it as the part of the dying process, like freezing the brain before any any decay could happen. It, it, if anybody uh, understood that differently, please please let me know. But that that was my understanding of what I read. Um, yeah. yeah. I, oh, I was going to say in the original studies that Robert published. Um, when he did the pig brain, the pig was actually alive and, I mean, obviously under anesthesia. And that is when they injected the glutaraldehyde. You know, it's kind of started the process while the pig was still alive. So, you know, that's the way the protocol is designed. But no one, I don't think no one really knows, you know, because the problem in humans is, you know, if you go back to the history of cryonics, you have to wait till they're legally dead and, and you know, and then try to rush in and, and do procedures and that. You know that's a huge open question. So the ideal way to do it, and what Robert's working on, is people actually doing you know assisted dying, and you know going right into you know as they're still living, you know the heart is still beating, go right into you know the the glutaraldehyde procedure. Right. Hmm, thank you. I see. So this is a in a scenario when this would be used to, like for instance, in when this is um. In, the, in, an, in a scenario when this is readily available, it would be more applicable for those who are on their deathbed and they're um, being given the treatment rather than just like say a patient dies in a car accident and they're brought to the facility. That's probably a lot of time already to lose memories. Okay, I see. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I know uh, that Hayworth published a protocol where like a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and they kind of choose a point in the future before the decay becomes too too much that they will begin the process right then to salvage as much as possible. Yeah, and that's what Robert is trying to do. Um, you know, is actually get at some point, you know, get a case of, you know, someone who's dying. And in the Netherlands, actually, they have done assisted dying in people with dementia. You just have to obviously do it early enough where the person can, you know, give consent, but, um, you know, they do that. I don't say all the time. I mean, you know, there's been, you know, a hundred something cases. That's still kind of a niche thing. I mean, you know, that's still, there's a lot of questions about, you know, how, um, you know, besides that, like you said, you know, people die in an accident, you know, how long can you, you know, preserve, um, tissue. And I mean, you know, I think those are a bunch of open questions. And I think that hopefully there's some leeway that, you know, you don't have to do this instantly, but. And, and there's evidence as well. Um, if, uh, you know, you're in a, a cooler environment uh, where the temperature is already lower and that's where you pass away, the degradation may be a little bit slower. So there may be a little bit more time. Um, whereas a place that's, you know, a, normal warm temperature, it could happen within minutes. Hmm, okay. Um, and uh, I do have another question then. Um, um, uh, how long um, can glutaraldehyde um, preserve um, uh, a brain in its like classifiably original state? Like, is it, um, is it like decades or centuries? I'm just, I'm curious, like what kind of, what's the, uh, What's the um, what's the time scale there? I I think the consensus is on centuries. Oh, uh, I don't I don't know that we know when it will stop. Yeah, if you lower it to the, you know, with the right. cryonics, now, if you just keep it at room temperature, maybe a few months. I mean, you know, no one no one knows for sure. But it's it's not super sensitive, also. So, for example, once you uh, fix. A, a, a piece of tissue, and you've had it down to some temperature. You can take it out, and you keep it. You can keep it in a refrigerator for a few days, or you can even keep it outside on the shelf for a few hours, and it's not going to do anything perceptible to the sample whatsoever. At least according to what Robert told me yesterday. Yeah, because he's thawed samples out for a couple of days, and then put them back in the, you know, the 
um, cryonic temperatures and then, um, you know, back and forth a few times. So, you know, you've definitely got some, some room, but yeah, long-term storage, it has to be, you know, whatever it was, minus whatever, a hundred degrees or whatever. So I think what we're really missing at the moment is we're missing any further peer review and, and sort of that feedback loop that usually gets started whenever there's been a new advance. Uh, you know, we're not the experts, obviously, um, but somebody who is an expert in the same technology, in the same technique, in the same uh, neurobiology, I expect that at some point there would be a response to the articles that Robert has produced and that there would be another cycle of at least investigating whatever the critiques are, if there are some, or just taking it to the next level. I haven't really seen that yet. Well, I think that's the, you know, that's what Robert is trying to do. And, you know, also Ken is just, you know, you, you've got to get the neuroscience community to take you, you know, seriously first before they're, you know, they're going to argue with you. and. Um, you know, I think that's what they're working on. That's the biggest challenge probably is because, um, you know, people are always saying, oh, we don't know how the brain works and we don't know. And, you know, of course, Ken or Robert really pushes back on, on people when they say that and kind of, you know, backs them into corner pretty quickly. But, um, but you know, I think that's the, the key is just to get the, you know, get the neuroscience community to start debating, um, you know, kind of debating these things, which hopefully we're getting there. I mean, it does seem like... Um, you know, slowly, um, you know, some of these ideas are, are t you know, taking off, but, um, but I know it's been a struggle to get, uh, you know, neuroscientists to, um, you know, and that's what, you know, Robert would say, if somebody says, you don't think it works, well, tell me why, you know, let's, let's, um, you know, what, what specifically, um, do you see as an issue, but he also needs to publish. I mean, he really needs to put some of these, these things out there in, in bigger journals and, and, um, you know, and I think that, I, that would help I, I too. Do, I do really like the angle that he's taking uh, on how he's pushing this now, because instead of focusing on the question of reconstruction and on whether or not people can survive this way, he's, um, he's just focusing preserving. more on just the preservation yeah. of memory and preservation yep. of knowledge. And it's very hard to argue that you wouldn't be preserving, in some sense, the knowledge that is in a person's brain by preserving the material of the brain. Um, in all likelihood, there's some way to get at that information in the future. It's sort of like how you would, maybe back when, when we first realized what the DNA was all about, if we had started preserving DNA at that time, just to build a bank of DNA that might otherwise be gone. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good strategy because, you know, you pen it to us very, and, you know, I think that's what Ken is doing with the uh, aspirational prize too, is just, you know, focusing on memory first. And then, you know, once you convince people of that, I think, you know, then you've got, um, you know, a much better um, shot at the whole, um, you know, why bother to preserve your brain kind of questions. If, if I recall correctly, I do, I do think that um, McIntyre is starting to receive like some uh, like cadaver brains, you know, that, that are able to be used on research through ne uh, Nectome so that at least pieces can be preserved that way, uh, potentially used for research later, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. I, yeah, I don't want to misquote him, so I don't want to say anything that I'm not absolutely sure of, but I think you're right that he certainly has access to some samples. samples. Um, that's not the same as saying that anyone has actually been preserved with his method for the purpose of storage. That's, I wouldn't want to go that far. Um, although it, it seems like he is gearing up to, to offering the service or offering at least a subscription to the service. Well, I agree. I would love to see um, some more publications uh, come out of his research and his group. Um, 
So Anita, yes. I take it that you you personally have no problem with the uh, with the coffee problem. Let's just say you don't you don't think there's any issue in uh, storing someone's brain and then recreating them from that. Or personally, your views on that? No, no. I at this point I would I would round my concerns uh, for the uh, the idea of successful uh, scan scan and copy to zero. Um, and there, there are things that are interesting about like the idea of, of the self, how do we identify the self, um, uh, how, how can I be reassured that on this new substrate, I would still have the experience of being me. And um, yeah, it, that's, a, that's a kind of a tough one, like how, how can we prove that before, before we try? Uh, yeah. but, but I feel fairly confident that uh, it, it, it seems like a worthwhile direction to go. I don't, I don't have a lot of qualms with that. Okay. Yeah. This was just sort of a side question of mine because, you know, the, the workshop is coming up next weekend and there's that question. But um, more to the point of uh, Nectome and Robert and all of that, I understand that what Nectome is hoping to do is to do full body of preservation using this procedure rather than say, neuro only or brains only, the way that, uh, that has often happened at Alcor. And I asked, I asked Robert why he would do that. Um, and that's kind of where the story veers away a little bit from the story about just preserving knowledge or preserving memory. Because the reason why he would want to preserve whole body is because he feels that even if you are doing whole brain emulation and uploading after this, if you scan in the entire body and you create an emulation of the body as well as the brain, then you won't have to go through physiotherapy once you're there again. So his concern is that uh, if you take just the brain and then you create an artificial new body for a person, that then they will have to go through with essentially physiotherapy to become used to using the body. Now, I didn't debate that any further with him. We didn't talk about whether there's any accelerated ways to do that once you have access to all of the nerves and everything. So we didn't really get into that in any depth, but it seems like that was the reason why he's thinking of doing whole body, despite the fact that preserving the glutaraldehyde stabilized tissue at that temperature that they have to stabilize right now is the major cost, is a, is a, is a big cost uh, a burden. And of course, if it's a whole body, then that's a larger volume that you have to store. You can't store as many in the same volume as you would if it was zero only. So that was an interesting little detail uh, I found. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's very interesting. Um, I mean, that that is one of the big concerns is like, how, how do we, you know, maybe we have all of this stuff stored in our brain, but how do we cue it back into life if we don't have the normal inputs that we've been used to having and from like a systems perspective um you know our body is made up of a lot of systems and a lot of neurons not just in our brain and they're connected and without the ones that we're used to uh, getting getting the ball rolling so to speak for recognition might be a little bit more difficult so i i could see the appeal of having having the whole body preserved as well Um, I'm a little, con little, I have a question about like uh, preserving the whole body for physiotherapy. Um, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not, an, I'm not un clearly understanding like um, in what form that would, that would mean. Like if, if you, like, for example, if you're emulated as just a digit, as a digital self, I don't see how like physiotherapy after emulation would be um, necessary. Uh, so, I, I mean, is he like, um. Uh, is he referring to physiotherapy after emulation in some way like that, um, or what is what is? Okay, so I'll be honest that when when Robert mentioned this at first, I was very confused, and I thought that maybe he meant that we had to be brought back in biology, that you had to reverse the glutaraldehyde fixation process and somehow revive people the way that many at Alcor want to be revived. But that was not his point. His point was that. Um, the precise way in which the brain is communicating with the muscles in your body 
through all of the peripheral nervous system and uh, and the rest of your uh, your, your your nerves and, and and connections in the spine and elsewhere in the body. That is complex, and if you've had an accident or you haven't used your muscles for a while or you had a transplant, let's say you've received someone else's finger or something, then you may need to um, go through physiotherapy to get used to using that limb or using those limbs. And if it's an entire body, then I guess that could be quite a bit. Uh, it, it might almost be like you've been uh, paralyzed for a week or something like that or a month and uh, and now suddenly you need to learn how to do everything again. Um, so that's where we didn't get into any deep discussion because um, while I think he's right that if you were to naively approach this as, okay, we're just going to uh, reconstruct your brain and then we're going to take an artificial body and we're going to connect that directly and then the brain's just going to have to figure out how to work with it and the brain has to do all the learning, which is what we would do today, right? If we just plug an artificial limb into, say, uh, the motor area of the brain or something, or in, into the cerebellum or something like that. If we wanted to do something like that today, then indeed that would involve physiotherapy. I have a hunch, but it's no more than a hunch, that that's going to be a little different when we're talking about um, a system where you have access, because you've done an upload, an emulation of the brain, where you have access to every single new artificial neuron uh, whether it's simulated in a computer or built in some other fashion, and you could uh, you could you could more intelligently engineer what I would call the translator between that and whatever your body is going to be. So it may not involve the same sort of physiotherapy. It's, sure, there might be you know this five minute thing for for each of your limbs where you need to figure out how the controller works. You know, and you figure that out very quickly because the controller adapts to your output signals your brain is producing output signals and that gets transformed into what you're supposed to do with your body. So I can imagine that there would be engineered solutions that can be more efficient than physiotherapy. But those are just hunches and I've never really looked into it. So I get his point at least, yeah. But yeah, on the flip side, it means then you have to do an emulation of the body as well. And that's not super easy either. You have to reconstruct all that too. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I did have one other, one final question um, that I had um, uh, as far as, um, uh, which relates to identity, but then also like where the boundary of identity is. Because um, uh, we're talking about um, preserving the memory. Um, uh, my question is, is, is preserving the memory, um, kind of, is m more risky than, than the rest of the brain? Because, uh, as I understand it, you could, you could, um, you could, uh, pinpoint the memory in the hippocampus, but it, it seems like for identity, um, uh, I mean, if you're concerned about, like, what, what makes up one's mind, then there's there's also like a, where the consciousness resides, which if if I got this right, it's in the uh, frontal cortex. Um, uh, is the um, does the entire brain uh, like does that just preserve the same, or could you say that the hippocampus is more vulnerable to like degradation after death, um, uh, especially if like the memories are the most vulnerable thing? Um, uh, is that a factor? Um, somebody else should, would probably do better to add to this as I, I can only answer so much of that. Um, but I think, I, I think that preserving the whole brain in part is important because some of what you said, I'm not sure has been proven such as where consciousness actually sits in the brain. And there's also multiple areas of the brain where memories are stored, uh, depending on which point of, uh, like what level of creation they're at. And, and even that, it seems based on my research to be uh, an, open, an open topic of research. Um, so preserving the memories alone, I, I'm not sure if we could even do that without preserving a lot of other stuff at this point. Yeah, I also think this runs into the problem of what people call memory. Uh, the definition of memory is, um, it's a little vague when people don't say what they mean. 
so, you know, in a lay person's vocabulary, when we say memory, then we say something like, oh, yeah, I remember that party yesterday, or, oh, I remember what a car looks like. And then we say, that's a memory. But memory is also how you move your fingers when you play piano, the particular way that you walk, your gait, um, the way you pronounce things, um, the way that you process what you're seeing when you see a red car and how that associates with memories that you have of red and of cars and of that time when you went on a holiday somewhere and then what that evokes, so that whole downstream propagation that happens. So the, so the reality is that, um, that it's more than just what we normally think of as memory when you're playing a memory game. It is, is all of the places where there has been a change in the brain because of an experience that you went through because of your life and your living. Not just that, of course, the blueprint as well, what you started with when you were born, but then add to that all of those changes and every synaptic change that's happened. All of that, in a sense, is memory. And so when you talk to a physicist and you ask them, what is memory? They'll say, well, it's any process where if you look at the function, it's got hysteresis in it. So in other words, once, once an activity has happened, the next time the activity happens, the, the function will produce a slightly different output because of the activity that happened before, then there's memory in that function. There's memory in that system. That's memory at the, very much at its foundation. And so, yeah, you can't just carve out a piece of the brain and say, we only need this bit, unless, you know, unless we've discovered that we could, there are parts that are so general that you can just put in a general purpose uh, piece of that brain and the rest of the brain will work with it quite easily. And in fact, that's actually something there where the hippocampus may be a good candidate because the hippocampus has cells that, uh, that are not required um, perpetually for the memories that, are, that they are learning. Uh, after a certain period of time, your memory, as it becomes long-term memory, becomes independent of reactivation in the hippocampus, and those same cells are reused to learn new things. So you could almost say that's a general purpose um, resource, a pool of cells that can temporarily store pointers to patterns of activity elsewhere in the brain. So you'll have some of those pieces in the brain where perhaps at some point we can decide that it, you might as well make them general purpose and not care so much about reconstructing them specifically. But then again, if we're reconstructing 90% of the brain specifically, then maybe the, next, the rest of the 10% isn't a big deal either. So then you just do the whole thing. Could go either way, I think. Yeah, I think I think um, to to kind of go off of that, like there, I I feel like I'm of two minds. On on the one hand, it would be nice to preserve as little as possible and only have the stuff that's absolutely necessary. And whatever redundancy exists across humans can just be recreated in general in an emulation. But just like with the issue with the the body, it may be easier for the brain to uh, adjust. To an emulated environment if it has the component parts including maybe some of these pieces in the brain that may be multi-purpose. I don't know. Yeah, there, there are so many strange things we could explore once we have some emulations to work with, even if they are just emulations of very small animals like the elegans or the sophilus, because Another thing that will be really interesting to, uh, to future developers on whole brain emulation is what if we can make the whole system a bit more clean? Let's say instead of using neurons that fire unreliably or synapses that fire unreliably and this probabilistic soup that's in there, what if we had units that actually really preserve memory and you never really forget memory? What if we can clean it all up and in the end you basically just need a tenth of the cells that are there if these are uh, a certain type of reliable unit and it works just a little differently. If the experience is still the same, if it turns out after experimentation, after study, we find out that this doesn't change, um, you know, the sense of, of being, the sense of being yourself, it could be that there are a lot of ways of translating, simplifying, uh, optimizing uh, pieces of how the brain works as part of a process of enhancing who we are and how we work, and that's all super speculative, but it's the sort of thing that I imagine is possible when you really have access to the entire system, and you can learn from it, and you can study it, and you can play with it, you can try out things, and when something isn't as you desire, you can back out, you can 
you know, you've tried that little thing, you decide that you don't want it. Like if you try, uh, I don't know, a medication that turns out to have side effects you didn't like, then you don't take the medication anymore. Something along those lines. You make it sound like a really cool, like, human mind video game. Well, that's what I think is going to happen. If we can actually, if we can choose our own self-directed evolution because we have access to everything and we can directly work with it, then I think what you get is this, what I often call new next Cambrian explosion of possible directions, branches in which people can choose to develop. I think there will be a huge ecosystem of new intelligences in a sense. But yeah, it's so hard to put, sort of, even predict anything there. I think maybe this is room for science fiction writers to explore a little bit to give us some idea of what might be possible. Yeah, actually, um, and and uh, Keith Wiley might argue with me a little bit on this one, but I love the idea of uh, with the whole branching uh, branching personalities to to solve kind of the problem of first truth. Like if you read a book first and then you watch a movie it colors your experience of the movie but then you never get the experience of like watching the movie first which would then color the experience of the work of the book but if you can you know have two different ones that go out into the world and experience it differently then re-emerge later then you solve that problem and can have one truth but from two different pasts yeah i i have wondered a lot about merging people how that could be accomplished. It's an interesting thought, merging back together. I'm not actually sure if Keith was even on the, is Keith here for this journal club? Uh, bad day, maybe not. Oh, well. So I, I don't know, Michael, do you think that this is the time where we thank Anita for her wonderful contribution, or are there still people waiting to ask questions? Do you see anything come in? Let's see. Let me check. Uh, we don't have any further questions. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, I guess with that, um, unless anyone has any other questions at the moment, um, thank you very much, Anita. Um, it was a pleasure, and it was a great thank discussion. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, I will go ahead and end the stream right now. <laughs>